Welcome! My name is Douglas Getz, and you've found your way to the Diving and Thriving podcast. Here, we have enlightening conversations about how we can better navigate this sometimes crazy world we live in. From refreshing spiritual perspectives to tips about personal growth, the focus here is about how we can become better human beings. So I'd like to thank you for being here today, and I hope you enjoy this episode. All right. Welcome, John. What's up, Doug? How are you? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing well. It's good to see you. Really good. I'm happy to get you on the podcast, man. This is yeah, a- man. My first podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad. And this is the first video podcast that I'm doing. So cool. It's, uh, it's been trial and error. It's been developing as it goes and how most things work. And so I finally got to the video platform. This is going to be uploaded to YouTube and then we'll see if we can get it. We can get it on video on Spotify. And like Sweet. Podcasts and yeah. So yeah. Video can get there. If it can't, then we'll just keep audio over on, on those platforms. But it's going well, man. Yeah, it's, it's going it's great. Well. Yeah. I'm happy to have this podcast. I'm happy to see the, the main reason I wanted to get this podcast was because I would have so many good conversations over mm-hmm. the years. And I would say, I wish this conversation was recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember having long, long conversations on the phone and we're like, we should have recorded that. Yeah, like, yeah, some, you know, I feel like most conversations uh, with you could could be recorded. You know, it's like, uh, it's a good dialogue. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, man. I, and I've been thinking that for years. Like, yeah, people that I would encounter, I'd chat with like advisors at my school financial financial yeah. guy i would just chat with him i was like man i gotta i gotta start a podcast because these conversations <laughs> need to be recorded yeah yeah so, yeah i feel like your energy too is uh is perfect for it you know because it's like uh you hold the space for people and you, you you know you're able to be vulnerable and able to show emotion to and and allow people to do the same and, and that in return is usually a very well-rounded um good conversation so yeah you're gonna you're gonna do well i can already see it thank you thank you my brother i appreciate it Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah let's let's talk about you so like i met you back Mm -hmm. at firefly music festival yeah yeah the shirt was appropriate for today yeah yeah jesse was uh he was teaching our buddy jesse um he was teaching yoga uh for firefly and ended up giving me a free ticket because of it so i was very grateful for that and uh yeah, I think he was teaching a class and then you had taken it yeah. and and you were right. You were like next to me close by. And then right after I saw you, you coming over to our campsite, and you gave me one of those big Doug hugs and the rest is history. You know? <laughs> That's so great. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It was good. I remember going to the campsite and then I remember seeing you guys. And I was like, oh, wait, that's that's the dude that just taught the yoga class. And then mm-hmm. you were there, yeah. too. So I was like, oh, these guys. So was, yeah, after you mentioned something about how nice the yoga class was. Yeah, man. Yeah, we just yeah. chilled. I think I was like, I was volunteering at that time, so yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. Oh, this is a nice break from from volunteering. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had a bunch of fruit. You know, I brought a lot of fruit, yeah. and uh, we we just connected the whole rest of the weekend. You know, we did all the shows together. It was like we shared the one yoga class, and then it was just kind of we were boys. And then your camp met my camp, and we were, uh, you know, we just all connected very well, and then. Oh. Our, na- our neighbors then too as well mm-hmm. and we had yeah. like a nice little firefly flam- family before yeah. i knew it yeah those are we had some like really good neighbors that other group yeah. Had next, um yeah uh alice alice, alice yeah alice and uh, then Dav. jake sav jake. um what's her name did it start uh, with an I, yeah yeah it did <laughs> it started with an m yeah <laughs> Okay. All right. Please forgive us. Please forgive yeah. us. <laughs> please forgive us. You, you but yeah, man. It's cool to. It's it's crazy to think about festivals, you know, because of where we're at now and how live music and festivals have kind of just uh, been on pause. And I was, I feel like I was at one of the last ones, one of the last festivals in uh, in Vision in, in um, Costa Rica uh, this past March. So I'm just coming up on a year. Um, and it's just crazy, man, to think, you know, how often I would go to shows and how 
always hit a festival at least every summer and then to not do it. And, you know, I try to tell myself it's, uh, I've enjoyed enough of them. So I'm not trying, I'm not chasing that. And like, oh, I didn't really get to experience concerts. I've had more than enough experiences at concerts and festivals. So, um, but it's crazy because that's kind of like, something you look forward to and then when it gets taken away it's like all right you just got to replace it with something else fun and you can still you know i think i i have an, enough friends that are musically talented and enough um enough friends that you can make it still happen and and do little get togethers and you know be safe and whatnot but still some live music and and uh bare feet in the grass you know those kinds of things that's it's really good for you so you know man yeah, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a quality time. Um, festivals, festivals have something about them that, that makes people really come together. Yeah. And I think, I think music, I think it's definitely the music. Music has mm -hmm. a lot to do with it because that draws everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Also the fact that you're, you're there for three, four, five days mm -hmm. on the festival grounds camping. Yeah. 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 That's a fantastic time too, because there's, there are no parents there. Tell yeah. you what you can and can't do. Yeah. Like, you're, yeah. you're free to roam. You're free to do whatever you want to do. And it's it's like, it's an incredibly freeing atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can really be yourself. And I feel they, they set it up that way. So it's like, uh, it's your your ideal environment. You know, you got, you got people at camp, you know, singing songs. And then you got someone cooking. And then it's like, oh, I'm leaving to go see a concert down there. It's like crazy mm -hmm. how... Uh, I, I, and I feel people really connect and they have some of the best weekends they've ever had in those three or four days because they never really get to experience that um, in main in society, you know, and just everyday life. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's kind of crazy that those three or four days it, it can you say to yourself, oh, this is how I want to live. And I'm not saying go to a show every night, but just the connection that you build with your neighbors that you never met and you know, you're hugging people and you're having heart to heart conversations with somebody that you met an hour before and you're go, able to go deeper and connect more with them than some people you knew most of your life. So there's something about that that is very special. And uh, I mean, look at us, you know, we we met each other very short brief of time for what, three, four days and we stayed in contact. You know, you came to my apartment, slept over. We've had a couple great experiences together and we still stayed in contact. And that's just off of one little weekend you know so that's all it takes and a lot of my friends I've, I've met through that kind of uh culture and uh very awesome awesome people and and, and like-minded people and i think that's another thing that draws me towards festivals certain festivals there's other ones that aren't as aligned but there's a lot that are and those are the ones that um i like to to support and stand behind so yeah yeah there's there's so much good that comes out of them yeah the amount of people that come together like you said you could be best friends with somebody just then you met them an hour ago and your vibes just mesh and it's awesome. yeah and you might not even know their name it's like, what, what was your like, name again <laughs> what's your name again yeah i know exactly. it's funny mm -hmm. yeah, those, those festivals are great i think firefly yeah. was the top one that i went to mm -hmm. so far at least because i'm still yeah. it's not not new in the festival mm -hmm. career because i've been to i've been to folk fest mm -hmm. Philadelphia folk fest four times three four times now yeah. um firefly was the first time there that was by far just it was it they took it to another level like yeah. people that own firefly own coachella so coachella mm -hmm. is what firefly um, yeah the promotion company is yeah that's crazy and yeah the big names was nuts like watching zed Mm, yeah 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 see i had a little different experience because i was l coming from um costa rica the first year first year i went like two years ago so i'm coming from a festival just for the people a little background it's a um it's a very like well they call it envision because they want you to envision how you want to live your life you know so it's very very well thought out um they do workshops every day they have speakers they have it's not just music and get messed up and doing all that it's very much like you're a student you know you can learn about permaculture you can learn about eco building 
I actually did an internship and apprenticeship program when I first went out there of uh, eco building apprenticeship. So uh, and permaculture design, all that kind of stuff. And that was a two week course and that led up to the festival. So I'm learning how to compost plastic five different ways and five different types of plastic, breaking it down and separating it. And, uh, you know, learning permaculture and how to run a garden and how, have it all connected and how you're using all the parts of your environment. So I'm taking all this in for a month or two at, when I'm in Costa Rica and then I come back and I go to Firefly and like the first thing I see is like a guy, you know, drinking a beer and throws it over his head and just like he leaves it. And I'm like, oh, man, this is completely different. At first it was a shock. And, if, and at first it was a little like distasteful. But then I said they're just in their own on their own journey. You know, I, I've learned to have a little more compassion for people through my own journey. But um yeah, you know, some people could say, oh, I'm not going to that. They're not they're not where I want to see or what, what I envision my life to do, you know. So I enjoyed it because I, I still was able to find the fun in it and find the experience um, amazing, you know, and I had great connections with you guys and the music was awesome. And so I, I've been able to see both sides of the spectrum, you know, the very much like everything's organic you you know in Costa Rica you get your food on a banana leaf and you drop the leaf on the ground and decomposes into the ground you know and then you go to the complete opposite um like Firefly or Bonnaroo or some of the like my first festival was Bonnaroo and that was wild and that was in Tennessee and uh you know just insane like uh, that's one of the biggest festivals you know it's kind of like a Coachella feel but to go to something like that it's like you went to another dimension and you get you either are going to go through an experience like that and say, I think I'll never really want to do that again, or you're hooked and you're like, I love these things and where's the next one and let's keep going, you know, and I got a real taste of festivals. It was the summer of 2014 and we did like five different festivals, just back to back to back, going to shows every, all the, all Friday, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, like it was a lot. It's a lot of money spent too. And so back to what I was saying, I, I got my fix of that kind of lifestyle. And now I'm much more old school. I feel like an old man when it comes to that. It's like you kids have fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I feel that. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And, and as you're at the festivals, like you meet people, I know yeah. people that just go from festival to festival. Yeah. Summer. Mm -hmm. They love it. And it's yeah. a joyful time. And, they just had those experiences all summer. And mm -hmm. you're like, I look at that as like my kind of vacation. Yeah. You don't, you don't really, you don't really go far. I mean, I mm -hmm. Delaware, that was like an yeah. hour and a half mm -hmm. here. And that's right. uh, it, an amazing it, five days. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> and it's expensive, you know, so yeah. you are yeah, getting. Especially like, and that was, that was going to be my next point, especially if you combine the aspect that not many people know about. But if you start volunteering for the festivals. Yeah, that's smart. You did that, once, right? Once you're volunteering, yeah. Our our festival ticket, I think in total, because Firefly did it funky, um, did it did a different way. It was like 140, 149 for the volunteer ticket price versus like 350. Okay. And then wow. not only that, but they would pay us like eight or nine dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. for two eight-hour volunteer shifts. So we got okay. paid $9 an hour for 16 hours, which was roughly like the ticket price. Mm -hmm. um, and, you were, and you were getting a free meal too, weren't you? And then they would give us a $10 food voucher yeah. for both shifts. Yeah. So we got – and then even, even better, uh, they sent out an email in the beginning that was a, a before and after shift. So you could work the Thursday – and then you could work the Sunday and be all free in the middle. Yeah, that's cool. So at the end of it, we, I think, I think I ended up getting paid to go there. <laughs> like it was, yeah. it was like $10 difference, but it was, it was cheap as ever. Mm -hmm. um, Folk Fest does the same thing where their volunteer tickets are like $50. Yeah. We volunteer usually like three, six hour, three, eight hour shifts. Mm -hmm. One or the other. But they feed you breakfast and dinner. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. So, yeah. so you there there are ways if, if you go the volunteering route, then then you can definitely make those festivals cheaper. Oh yeah. I mean there's friends of mine I know that did it all summer. They just bounced from one to the next and volunteered. And mm -hmm. you know, it, it's 
it's an awesome opportunity. It's just, you got to pace yourself. You know, you try to do that. And then by that third festival, it catches up to you and you want to do nothing but sleep. Cause uh, coming back to reality and society sometimes after that fourth day can be a little daunting, a little depressing. It's like, wait, what was that life I was just living? And what is this and what yeah. work? And so, yep. you know, it's, it's good to take it in uh, increments. I think, you know, like I, I always said after I started doing it, a little more I was like at least one a summer is nice and then I started doing one in the winter time in Costa Rica but it's their summer so it was like it was that was weird too because then you do a festival in the winter and then summertime comes around you're not like I mean of course you're craving it but you already got your fulfill fulfillment there so it's kind of uh but yeah I so I, I got to see you at, at a folk festival because uh yeah I, was, I got the opportunity to have a um, help out as the chef for a friend of mine, Natalie. Uh, she, she works for Green Lane Naturals and she also got the opportunity, they asked her to have a stand there, all plant-based, organic. And so her and I uh, created a menu and it was a lot of fun, great experience. I, I remember being very overwhelmed and like excited, nervous, all that kind of stuff because you just, I mean, it's the oldest festival in the country, Philadelphia Folk mm -hmm. Festival. It is, and, yeah. And you, and you don't know how many people are going to eat, you know? Could this, people could not want your food or they could devour it and you got to figure out how much to buy. So that was tough. Yeah, we did, uh, we did smoked jackfruit tacos. We did a, um, which was really good. I, I think that was our best seller. We did a, a like a folk, folky fresh salad, a very all organic stuff to all local. It was like very, well thought out. We did um, a chicken salad wrap, but it was made out of chickpeas and, you know, toasted almonds, Dijon, and did some dill in there, all that kind of stuff. So then we did banana whips for the kids and for anybody who wanted ice cream, that was a healthier alternative. And then we did young Thai coconuts for some refreshment. So people weren't getting dehydrated on their, their, uh, you know, their walks and, and they're dancing all night. And uh, yeah, it was, so we ended up getting asked to, come back and, and every year they pick one vendor that um, they want to cook for the higher ups of the folk festival. And we actually got picked to do that. I don't think I told you that, but no. yes, yeah, so they, they actually asked us to be there for the next 10 years as a stand. Uh, so we made a good impact. Yeah. But then, you know, COVID hit and then the whole world flipped. So we'll see if that comes back, but uh, it was, it was an amazing opportunity and it was, it was something to put on your resume. And for me, just to give a little background, I, I went to culinary school and uh, I, I tried to, well, first I tried to do the whole business major and all that at Penn State. Yeah. And I just kind of couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do. A couple of buddies and I, uh, we started a t-shirt company, um, organic and uh, organic cotton and bamboo t-shirt company. So I got a feel of like what business was. I was president of sales, which really was like, you know, we were just giving our, our, ourselves labels at that point. And uh, so I, I got a taste of business. So I went to school for that, thinking that's what I'll do. And then I came home after a couple of years and thought, you know, I'll just, I'm just going to work because that maybe that's what I should just do right now. It's just work. So I started working in a restaurant and really enjoying it and liking the food, you know, liking the cooking and getting quick with it and getting my knife skills down and all that and realizing like, you know, I have some talent here. There's definitely a skill set that I'm, I'm honing in on. So I worked my way up at that restaurant to, you know, kitchen manager and to general manager and then head chef and all that stuff. And so I, I had like a, a great experience while it lasted for about five or six years. But while I was there, I said, you know, I'm going to go to culinary school because I want to I want to be more valuable. I I personally thought I deserved a little more money. So I wanted to bring that to the conversation of what could I do to earn a little more money out. And I even brought a list of like how I think I add value to the company, which wasn't necessary. You know, he's, he knew that I needed a raise, um, but he had thought this was my boss at the time. He said, you ever think of culinary school? So I ended up doing it two year program. And uh, while I was there, I had a great experience. I just loved all of it. You know, I loved the subject matter and, and I wasn't plant-based then. And, and now I'm more vegetarian, but thankfully I wasn't because we were fabricating meats and, you know, I was, um, kind of not dissecting, but breaking down like different kind of animal parts, you know, and I, I uh, 
it was all fascinating for me because it was finally a subject matter that I really enjoyed. And I was in the front of the class taking notes and getting Dean's list and every single little extracurricular thing I would do. And uh, there was a Iron Chef competition, which uh, I partaked in and um, I got second place in, which was a lot of fun. And it was a very like intense experience. Uh, you know, it was like out of this, out of the show. I got a, someone in my face with a microphone saying, what are you cooking now? What are you cooking now? And then video <laughs> camera following me everywhere. And yeah, it, like what I wanted to do, you know, it was like, I've always wanted to be on shop and all that kind of stuff. So I had that experience and we did well, you know, I got, it was a partner and I, um, and, uh, yeah, we got second place, but you know, they gave you like $5,000 scholarship and new knife set and all that kind of stuff. Um, so fast forward, um, I started, you know, doing more, uh, catering once I left the other, the restaurant I was at. Um, cause my mom actually has a painting business. So I painted a lady's house and just so happened she was a caterer, she, catering chef and she, her chef was leaving. Um, and so she was looking for a chef and I had just graduated and she's like, wow, perfect opportunity. Can I hire him or can I interview him? And so I went over the next day and knocked out the interview and yeah. then I started working for her and, uh, I did more fine dining catering and it was, she was really treating me like a chef, you know, she would. Yeah. She was paying me to to go to Connecticut and paying me travel time and put me in a hotel. And, uh, you know, I'm doing like I'm doing dinner parties by myself and I've, I got booties on my feet because the floors are so nice. I'm putting deviled I'm putting uh, caviar on deviled quail eggs and, you know, tuna tartare and steak carpaccio. And I'm like, wow, this is this is what I kind of envision that I would want to do, you know, it's like being that chef that you know, you're making the food, no one's around you and you hand it to the server and they come out and they come back with just nothing but compliments. It's like, this is, this is my kind of thing. You know, this is my field. And, uh, so I started doing more of that. And then, you know, I can't remember how I met Natalie, but I'm drawing a blank on how the first situation where we met, but anyway, she, we have become friends and she asked me if I would help her with folk festival. And so I was like, wow, that's, that's cool. You know, I've always, of course I've been going to festivals, but like to be the one actually cooking there, it was, it was an honor, you know? So I took it on and uh, we, we did a great job. I think, you know, we had a really, a really good team and we knocked it out and I had a lot of friends come by like yourself and other people supporting it. Um, and uh you know, I'm glad that I had that experience and I didn't say to myself, that's what I want to do. I'm just going to work festivals because look where we're at now. So, um, but it all worked out. Yeah. And cooking is now something that even though I'm not doing as much of, um, I can still get creative in my own kitchen and my own apartment and having dinner with friends. And it's just such a cool way to connect and share something uh, and, and cooking with love and then providing that to people is something that I enjoy too. So. That's yeah, great, man. That's great. And mm -hmm. so when you were when you were cooking at these catering events, would you would you come out as the server was coming out and say, "No, no, I, no, 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 <laughs> drizzle." No, <laughs> that's the server's that? job. That's the server's job. But I'd have to that's tell them what to job. say. Okay. And uh, my job was to hold down the kitchen, you know, and and making sure everything's coming out hot and on the right platters and seasoning it well and. Uh, and then, you know, I'd have multiple servers. So we would do past hors d'oeuvres for a couple hours and, you know, just different cool appetizers, a two bite kind of thing. And then so they, they'd run that out and I'd work on the next tray to get ready and then send that out. And then there'd be all kinds of different parties. So we'd have, you know, we'd have catered like family style where it's more buffet. And then I would do like plated dinners where it got really intense and, uh, you know, you have to know what wine pairs with the scallops and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the red should go with this ribeye. And it, it, it was getting, it, it's really cool. And that's like, that's another place you could take it. You know, you could go very much more into that field where it's very high caliber, you know. Uh, and, and that's fun, but it's intense. And usually the clientele who's having that food is very picky and they're very precise. And uh, so I give credit to those who do it, um, but I think I can have a little more fun with it and not not so much uh, fine, like extreme fine dining. I personally would like to do more of a catering, uh, a catering business where I like more, 
more like street food kind of thing the very flavorful but the things that people love and they want like a you know either finger food or like something to hold like a hoagie but there's really not a there's not a market i mean there's a market but it's evolving um of a plant-based kind of option for people like i'm in doylestown and there's a couple places but there's really nothing that's just mostly plant-based or vegetarian um there is one spot I really like nourished by mama shout out to them, but there is a lot of good spots around this town. I love the town. But when I, when I started eating this way and I did my, my kind of decision to go plant-based for my dad's sake, my, for seeing my dad suffer with diabetes growing up. Um, he's 70 years old, 71 now type one diabetic. And he's had it since he was about 30. His mom had it. His sister had it. So, I started doing more research, listening to podcasts. You know, I like Rich Roll. He's a he's one of my favorite podcasters. He's a um, he's like a vegan plant based uh, triathlete, and he gets a lot of great uh, a lot of great people on that channel. Just so many great doctors and cardiologists, and um, you know, nutritionists and holistic healers and acupuncturists. Everything that I'm interested in. Uh, so. I started realizing like, you know, you can prevent some of these diseases, even though your DNA has it running through the bloodline, really that's only about five to 10% impact on what your, your lifestyle is, you know? So there's a great, great quote that I'm trying to remember. Um, something about like lifestyle. Um, no, I'm going to butcher it. I don't know. It's something about, you know, you can, you can eat a certain way. Um, you can have something in your family, but the way that you live your life and the things that you do and the, and the quality of life that you live, the food that you take, the exercise, the books you read, all that is much more impact in your DNA. So I said to myself, I'm going to start trying this and, and avoiding some of this disease. I don't want to pass this on. I want to be the person that stops this generational curse from running through my family. I don't want my kids' kids to deal with this, you know. So I, I took it on myself. I say, I'll be the one that stops it, you know? And I went down that path of, of being very strict and I've messed around with a lot of different things. I've done the fasting, water fasting, juice cleanses, um, raw vegan, you know, vegetarian, just plant-based, just smoothies. I've, I've just tried so many different things. Mm -hmm. And um, for the most part, like throughout the week, I eat mostly plant-based but there'll be times where maybe on a friday or saturday i have a slice of pizza or something and i'm not as harsh on myself as i used to be i used to be my worst critic you know like uh you you shouldn't have that and just constantly keeping myself to a certain standard yeah and once the pandemic hit i kind of just eased up on myself a little bit and you know it's like have that slice of pizza and have that again the next night because you deserve it you know <laughs> yeah. next so uh, it's just you know i think you got to go through in my own experience, you got to, you got to, you know, you try to do one thing, say plant-based, and then you go down a path of not doing that and you eat more unhealthy. It's actually good. It's good in the long run, because if you see that that's unhealthy, then you can realize that that's a problem. Then you can revert, revert, revert back to plant-based. So for me, I've, I've kind of, kind of gone um, off the path a little to realize that the path is what I want to be on, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, man. And, and like, I also like to inspire people by just cooking what I want to eat. Like if I have friends over, if I go to like uh, a party or something, I like to bring, uh, like a vegan or plant-based dish mm -hmm. that way people are still going to like it. You know, it's still flavorful. It's well seasoned. It's all mostly like, you know, vegetables. Um, Mm -hmm. But then, then you give them that idea that, oh, wow, this is good. Maybe I could try eating this on a, on a Monday. You know, I used to start doing meatless Mondays with my mom back like five years ago. We just did like beans and whatever for taco night, you know, beans and like meatless crumble kind of thing. And then that turned into, let me try it on a Tuesday and then a Wednesday. And then I just kind of, but it's really up here. You got to, you got to have the willpower to do it and you have to make the decision and stick with it. It's yeah. like anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and I like I like what you brought up um, about like your food impacting your health. That's mm -hmm. actually a really big aspect. Um, yeah. Heard of macrobiotics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, 
my parents uh, back in like early 90s, late 80s, were doing macrobiotic courses. Mm. And so for people that haven't heard of it before, what macrobiotics is about is just a lot of it is looking at the energies of food. Mm -hmm. It's like yin and yang or yin and yang. Mm -hmm. um, your pronunciation yeah. like different vegetables have different energies so mm -hmm. leafy greens they grow upward yeah or they're more eat and then like carrots and root vegetables grow downward and they're mm -hmm. more young mm -hmm. and so really just life is about being in balance yeah and where where what feels best for you yeah and so if you notice yourself like feeling too eat you might eat some root vegetables and of course so it was, it was a lot of, of that. So as you bring up your food affecting how you feel and like ailments and different things, like looking at your food can really fix that. It can, Completely. Really, it can really steer illnesses mm -hmm. in certain directions, like bodily issues, mm -hmm. organs, not yeah. as well. It can, yeah. really, it can really help on that. Well, you know what I think is, uh, and you're completely right with that. Um, I think the gut health is probably the most important. And for me, one of the most fascinating things is our microbiome. It's what we're putting in our body that is then really going to our second brain, you know? So when you think about if I'm eating Burger King and McDonald's and all very inflammatory processed foods, well, it would only make sense that I'm going to find flare ups and inflammatory parts in my body as well if I have why does my back hurt now why does my why am I why is my skin breaking out worse why do I have acne and all that kind of stuff it's so many people try to cover up the surface part like oh I'll just fix the you know the acne and I'll do it the topical creams and all that but if you really knew that it's what's inside of you and cleansing the liver and cleansing the kidneys and the adrenals and the microbiome and doing colon cleanses and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I've gone down the rabbit hole of this health thing and this is what I'm very passionate about. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, and you know, I, I have to say this because I feel it's very important. And I kind of learned this myself that if you really want to go down this path of healing, uh, what has worked for me, because I did it kind of backwards. I tried to cleanse everything. I was like, Oh, I'll clean my, you know, my kidneys out, I'll do this dandelion extract and I'll clean my liver out. I'll do the celery juice in the morning and I'll do all these things. And I'm like, okay. And I've just, for the last three, five, three to five years, I've tried so many things because not just to feel better, but I'm, I, I love it. You know, I'm, I like to be the one who's the pioneer of like yeah. the healthy things that I can tell my friends, like this works, this doesn't work. You should go see her. Don't see him. You know, all these, I like to be I like to be that guy and um, because I like to be like a source for of healing for people, you know, so I can pass on, but you have to experience it and you have to have your own relationship with it to then digest and say, okay, I, I you should look down this path or whatever. So, um, and I, and I'm learning from people, you know, it's like that each one teach one I pass, I get it taught and then I pass it on. It's like, that's just how it goes. But what I will say, what I wanted to get at is that, if you're going to go on that path and you think to yourself, like, oh, I got to cleanse my liver, like you're getting a lot of headaches, you know, you should think it's probably liver related. If your eyes are, uh, is an issue in the eyes, it's, it's liver, kidneys are like your fear and your adrenals. It's like, it's really interesting at, um, how the organs actually play a part in our different emotions and where things store, you know, there's these organs that actually store emotions, like kidneys store fear, you know? Um, and, and, uh, I only have one kidney. I got it removed when I was, um, yeah, I was, just, let's see, in fifth grade in like 2000 or so, um, I got my right kidney removed, which is a long story, but I basically had like a, a long, um, <clears throat> well, I was going to have, I was going to run the pen relays and, uh, I was having all this like heart palpitations and I was super hyper. Right. And, and so I ended up having really high blood pressure, like 200 over 170. I had to get rushed to the cardiology. This is like a young, young boy, fifth grade, really not knowing what's going on. Just parents, seeing your parents like scared for you. And you're like, what's happening? So I ended up going to children's hospital and I stayed 10 days there. And uh, they tested my kidney, they tested my brain, they tested my heart. They couldn't figure out what this is coming from. Turns out I had my left kidney, the size of like a baby's kidney. 
uh, and the right one was functioning. No, I'm sorry. The right one got removed. The left one uh, was fine. So the right one looked like a baby kidney. And they were like, is this from a trauma? Did you have any kind of serious um, accident or something hit you there? Or were you born this way? And they don't, they didn't know. So they actually started a whole research foundation because of my case. And they were trying to look into this and why this happens to kids and blah, blah, blah. So turns out that I, um, it was a very scary experience for 10 days, a lot of testing and a lot of like traumatic things that I've worked through. Um, but, um, uh, turns out that, you know, you can live with one kidney completely fine. You only use really one eighth, I think of, of, of one kidney. So once I got that done, and once I went on this healing journey, I'm like, wow, fear is held in my kidneys and I don't have one of them. Does that mean I have more fear in one? And so I've been working on fear a lot, you know, like in the last year of trying to face my fears and trying to yeah. do my own kind of trauma work. And then also like understanding that I could be a little more fearful in certain things, but um, anyway, so that was a little tangent, but what, what I wanted to get at was if you're going to go down that path of doing cleansing of like the organs, what's to me most important and is a colon cleanse because you actually can't, you can't remove like anything. You can't um, cleanse really anything if you, if that's not clear, you know, so we don't have to get into detail, but you need what I would recommend for people who are, are going through it is to do like a two week colon cleanse like a gentle colon cleanse um you can take it you know you can i did one through um an apothecary a lady that i met she she kind of pointed me in the right direction and they're out there online just you know do your research but that way if the colon's clean right then all these other things and these impurities in the in the, in the different organs can then remove themselves like heavy metals for example a lot of us have taken antibiotics or anybody who's been vaccinated all these kinds of things there's heavy metals that are in them which can completely cause dizziness and you know fatigue and complete brain fog and i went through all of that and uh so i'm trying to clear that out of my brain and my body because they store in your muscles and things like that so I did all of these things, but I didn't clear the colon, didn't cleanse the colon. And then when I did that, I started feeling better immediately. So the headaches went away. My, my clarity was so much better. My brain fog disappeared. Like, so I can be a testimonial and say, if you're going to go down that path, do it the right way. Cause I did it backwards, you know? So, yeah. And what way did you do it? Which was... Well, if, if you I could recommend a gentle colon cleanse. Yeah, I think it was called Nature's Sunshine, what I did. Um, it was just like a, it was like a packet that you took with water and then you took two capsules. And I think in the capsules it had like psyllium husk and a couple other things, a lot of fiber. So it just binds you to, it binds things. And uh, I was doing a raw vegan diet for the two weeks just because I said to myself, I want to put nothing but pure organic foods in me. So I was like, you know, two weeks, I'll take it as serious, excuse me, I'll take it as serious as possible. And so I did it. And I, I'm not lying, man, after like, the next following week, I started to feel better. But you don't, you don't correlate it with what you just did. You're just like, going through life. And you're like, wow, I just feel starting to feel better, less anxiety, less depression, let and, and what people don't realize is some of the foods that we've eaten since little boys, you know, like the Snickers and the, everything that we would just gobble down, not thinking of what's really in this, yeah. it, it gets stored in the colon. And, um, you know, we don't have to go into detail of the, of the details, but it's, it's pretty gross to think that some of that food as a little kid is still in you. So until you actually clear that out, yeah. um, it's, you're still toxic, you know? Um, but that brings me to my next point, because I think this is very important. And uh, so I, I did more of a, like, once again, I, I reversed it. And, and this isn't the right way, but it's for me now to bring to the people, you know, so. Yeah, you're the pioneer. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I did more um, like healthy eating constantly for the last like four years or so. But it wasn't until I started fixing what's up here and doing more therapy um, yeah. and unfolding some of the traumas that I went through. So I was in a bad car accident a couple of years ago, which then kind of showed me 
um, and scared, scared the shit out of me to then show me what else I need to work on. Some people would mask it and say, you know, brush it under the rug, but I, I faced it. Cause once again, I had that thing in my mind of like, I'm going to face my fears. Nothing's going to, nothing's going to um, scare me or deter me. Of course, that's just me saying that, but I was scared like crazy. So anyway, I just want to mention that if you don't fix what's up here and you think I'll just eat vegan and I'll eat everything organic, it's not going to do it. You know, uh, you're, you can change your microbiome and all that kind of stuff, but the mind, you know, it's, it's what we're telling ourselves every day. And it's, it's so important. So it's funny. It's like, we can cleanse our body and all the organs, but we don't think to cleanse our mind, you know, and I'm not just talking exercise and walking and yoga. I'm talking like really facing your fears and, and what makes you the person you are and why you act a certain way to question that and say, you know, why am I that way? Why do, why do I have this in me that I don't really like about myself, but where does that come from? And having the courage to unfold that and, and dive into that area, which they call it shadow work. You know, it's like, you know, we're these light beings, but there's also just as much of darkness to make the yin and the yang, you know? So what do we usually do? We try to mask it or we find coping mechanisms or we just reach for dopamine hits and these kinds of things where it takes a certain person to say, I'm going to, I'm going to look at those aspects. I'm going to visit those dark places and I'm going to love those parts of me. And the, and once I love them, that's when I heal them, you know, and that's, it takes a lot to do. And I'll be the first to say, it, it will change. It, it scares the hell out of you. And it's not something to, to do and think you're going to knock it out. And, and that's like another point that I need to make is that what I did is I started doing EMDR therapy, which is more of um, trauma work therapy, where you, for me, I have like a vibrating thing in my one palm and in my other one, and I'm talking about my traumas. And as I'm talking about them, the left and the right buzz back and forth, right? So it's hitting left and right brain hemisphere. So it's actually like okay. stimulating it and then bringing it to their surface and pulling it out. Yeah. So I started doing um, some serious like heavy trauma work because I was not feeling myself. I was feeling very depressed. I was feeling very dis disassociated associated with like life. Um, so... I had the courage to say, I need help, you know? And I think that uh, a lot of us guys, especially just try to think now nah, I'm good. You know, don't, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll man up, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like, if you really want to man up, you know, do the work, you know, and, and, and uh, be, be courageous enough to be vulnerable and allow people to then be vulnerable. And, um, and not that everybody needs therapy. I just had a very, I had a couple experiences in my life that I, I think it would really help. And I give credit to anybody who's going through that because it's, uh, it's not easy, but it's worth it. So, so, uh, yeah, I, I was doing therapy. I was also doing like Monday meditations with a group of my, my good friends. Mm -hmm. And I just started, like, I was trying to rush things, you know, I was trying to fast track the healing. Oh, I'm just going to get this done. It's going to be, and I, you can't do that. You have to take it slow and it's going to take its course and it's going to take you where it needs to, you know, and you have to kind of surrender to it and you have to let go of the control because we're not in control. And uh, so, you know, I don't have to go into too much detail about it, but it was very intense. You know, I was, I was talking about things like um, I'll just tell you, tell you real quick. I don't know if I went into detail about the car accident, but I won't go into detail, but I'll just give you a little backstory. So it was actually four years ago, a couple of days ago, December 29th, four years ago, I was heading to a buddy's house, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm going around a bend uh, on a rainy morning. And I see a girl coming straight at me in my lane. Uh, and she was flying. She's going like 50 miles an hour. I was going like 30. I had no time to react before I could even think to move. I was already hit embracing for impact. And I hit straight head on, I dislocated and broke my right hip, broke my ribs, you know, I had like laceration on my leg. Luckily I was wearing my seatbelt, but like my seatbelt went and then my neck went out. So I got like arthritis in my neck and I got pretty banged up, you know? And um, the thing with me is I've always just tried to own up to, my, like I was talking about like man up, like I'm like, 
I'll just figure it out. Like I'll deal with it, you know? So I just tried to make the best of it and say, damn, that was crazy. And, but life goes on. Of course, you know, I had to recover for six months and whatever, but after I could finally walk again, um, which took me a little while, took me like three to six months and I was back on my feet. I was constantly distracting myself from what I've just went through, you know, where I should have said, I'm going to go, what, I need to process this, you know, I need to figure out like, what just happened? Why did my life just change? Why do I feel this way? You know, Yeah. instead, what did I do? I I started going to, I was first of all, smoking a lot, you know, I was trying to just mask it. I was, I'm not a real big drinker, but I do love Mary, you know, and um, started going to this, these nature parks and I was taking in the sunsets, you know, and I was, uh, I was just looking at the sun and, and, and like, I started kind of, feeling like this spiritual awakening that was happening right because when you go through some kind of serious thing like that a lot of the times you can have like a new uh you can have an awakening like you've been cracked open you know like wow this is life like i'm alive i'm breathing like thank god you know so everything can kind of shift and be like wow like each day is so powerful because i could have been gone you know so i have this one this one spiritual guide that I've seen, her name is Janet and she's an acupuncturist in Lansdale. She's a very like nurturing motherly figure uh, to me. And I haven't seen her in a little while, but I wish she she will. And um, so I went to her, I got acupuncture done and we had this very spiritual connection uh, where she had this crystal, she had this chakra crystal set, uh, all the different chakra points, but there was a crystal that followed each one. And she had them all like wrapped up and each one labeled of which stone it was and everything. And she told me, she said, I, uh, I want to gift these to you because uh, there's something that I feel here that I, I feel I need to gift these to you. I've been waiting years to gift these to somebody. And I was like, wow, you know, that was like such an amazing feeling. Yeah. And um, when she gave them to me, she let me in on like a, a, a secret of the universe almost where she said that you know, for the 30 minutes after the sun rises and the 30 minutes before the sun sets, you can stare right into the sun. It's called sun gazing. And people do it as like a religious, religious, spiritual experience where you're taking in what is like God consciousness, you know, which is without that light, we, I couldn't see you right now. I couldn't see anything around me. That's, that's where, what's what we are. You know, that's what I believe at least is that we, we come from that place. And, uh, and we have that that same fire within us, you know, a thousand fires, as they say. So I started doing that. I started doing it as like a religious practice. I would work, I'd run back to this preserve and I would stare right at the sun and I would be breathing in. And I, I started getting this amazing wisdom that was coming into my life and my awareness where I had to do something with it, right? I had to figure out like this has to be shared somewhere. So I started putting out these spiritual posts through Instagram because it just felt like universal truths, you know, like there's no denying this. I just know that this is a fact and these are like deep spiritual meanings, but I was gaining this wisdom from the sun is what I thought. Right. So, I mean, it is not though I thought it it is that. And uh, so I, I started doing it a lot for like two years, right. Almost like a year and a half, two years but you're the sun is the masculine energy right the moon is the feminine so i'm taking all this masculine and where in reality i'm going through the trauma work where i should be more the feminine energy the more vulnerable the yeah. caring the like heartfelt you know all that kind of stuff so i had an imbalance of my energy and and i was i was really doing it kind of i should have done the moon taken the moon in, you know so i went back to her after i started getting like i was getting like discomfort in my eyes you know which i'm like "Uh oh did i screw my eye and i'm like no no no, it doesn't and i've asked 30 minutes did i go too long yeah did i fry my eyes exactly so i've actually asked multiple eye doctors about it and the two that i've seen they're proponents of it they think that they're in full support of sun gazing they think it can actually prevent emf radiation and it can um open what it does basically it's coming in the eye and it's shooting out the third eye. So it decalcifies the pineal gland, mm. which the pineal gland, pineal gland is, you know, seeing truth and, and seeing things for what they are and being able to mm. see 
somebody's line and and seeing energy and like not getting the right feel of a person that all comes this area the pituitary gland you know so i started opening that up and i started seeing the world around me but fast forward i went back to her and i, I told her where i was at and i said you know i'm having discomfort in this area you know and she took it she took it back real quick and she's like oh you know, I feel terrible. I should have never told you. I said, you know, it's not, I didn't want to make it like an issue. I didn't even, I just wanted to see her again, kind of like a check in after all. Yeah. Me doing. Mm -hmm. So she started doing acupuncture around like my eyes, like, you know, in, in this area and she would do it. And just after she removed the needles, blood was coming down and it was like so much heat that was in this whole area because remember I'm going through trauma. So your brain gets inflamed. You know, and then it can send inflammation and into the gut, which sends it everywhere because you're once you go through these things, your body's in a fight or flight mode, right? So everything's panicky, everything's like fight or flight, which your brain's like frying, right? So I'm taking in the sun, which is heating the brain, and I'm already so I was in a bad place. Yeah. Yeah. So I come to, I come to her looking for wisdom. Like, what can I what can I do next? She goes, You need to take in the feminine energy she's like no more sun gazing i want you to look at the moon now so then i'm like oh man so i was just telling this the other day it's like i went down the masculine path of like i got this i'm fine i'm the warrior you know and then i took the moon in and i'm like more vulnerable i'm crying more i'm like able to feel my emotions i'm meditating more i'm all that and i went through that for about a year and now i'm coming out of it where i feel like i've visited both energies and i i met both parts of myself and i'm still meeting it you know i'm still unfolding myself but i feel i feel happy that i i went there and that i can come out of it now and observe the two and not necessarily be one or the other but be all of it you know yeah so uh i know it's a long drawn out story but uh i felt like that's important because just to bring it back full circle i just want to mention that with all the diet that you think you sh you should do and you it's still is it's still important but don't forget this part too because this needs the most cleansing and then once you cleanse this everything follows um so i did it backwards so if that helps somebody I would, uh, hopefully it does yeah yeah and that's that's an awesome lesson too like yeah story and awesome lesson because you know, I've, I've talked with that about with a lot of people, actually, and that's actually a, a commonly known thing in the right circles that shadow work, mm -hmm. like, can really change your whole life. Like, things that you're like, why, why do I always feel like I don't have enough money? Why, yeah. why is that the case? Yeah. Doing shadow work can uncover why that mm -hmm. is. Yep. Maybe it yeah. was a parent, maybe it was a situation that happens. Of course. You can, like, you can examine it. You can like yeah. blow it up, figure it out, and then say, "Do I want to be like this, or mm -hmm. what? What are other ways I could be if I let yeah. go of that?" Yeah. And even like even like I go to a chiropractor, and and similar to like eating well, like you have to. Well, number one, you have to want to get better. Because mm -hmm. he that's said, true. "Yeah, big part." That's number yeah. one. Because my chiropractor said, uh, "Shout out to Doctor O'Neill in Doctor. Bridgewater, New Jersey." <laughs> um he we, we had a full conversation about it and he said he won't take patients that aren't interested in getting better like mm. so she said there was this one patient that was talking about her one friend has so many issues and she complains at work so much and she's got these back issues and i'd love for for her to come and see you and he said i'm not i'm not going to be able to help her mm. like she i can i can do i can do the chiropractic work yeah. But unless she wants to get better, which it doesn't sound like she wants to, she likes yeah. the routine that she she's in and the habits she's formed. Mm -hmm. There's there's not going to be any helping her. Yeah. And so first step is wanting to get better. And mm -hmm. second step is he actually even uh, made the connection of like shadow work and working through traumas, mm -hmm. childhood traumas and different things as uh, something that affects the body similar to your your diet um aspects like yeah. as a chiropractor you said that that one lady was going through she was she was uh like her ex-husband or husband forget what what uh what title it was but the husband or the ex-husband used to be abusive 
And mm. so as she was like working through some of that and doing chiropractic work, I think the chiropractic work was spurring on some self-reflection where she was diving into it and she'd come back. And yeah. she said that she was developing like bruises on her arm. Mm. Mm. She was like, why are these here? And, she, and uh, eventually it came to her that, that that was where her husband would grab her. Wow. And it would leave like fingerprint wow. bruises on her yeah. arm. Yeah. And, and it was like the spur or the catalyst that kind mm. of like brought those things to the surface to yeah. be able to get past them. And I think yeah. that's, that's some of the biggest work that we can do yeah. is, is work through that, honestly. Mm -hmm. that, sure. that stuff, shadow work and childhood traumas, that's the stuff that really holds us back. Yeah. Like, it is. And some people will never do it. And that's the thing. It's like some people will never visit those parts of them. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just yeah. I give credit to those who 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 take it a step further, you know, because you're going to find so much out about yourself, you know, where it's going to take you. Nobody knows. But I can tell you this much that where it takes you is a better place than where you start, because you're going to end up coming out of it with compassion for other people who also go through it. And that's where I'm at now. And I, um, I read a good book, the art of compassion. And, and I just, I feel like compassion is so important that, you know, like somebody like the lady you just said, who, um, you know, she was kind of playing the victim of not wanting to get better. And because of that, she couldn't necessarily get the help. I've been that victim before. And so for me, I could be compassionate for her. Um, instead of saying, Oh, just try it, you know, push yourself to do the work. It's like, that's what people want you to do. But once you realize, once you're in that position, you have to, you got to do it in a gentle way and everybody's running their own race. Yeah. And to force somebody to do their shadow work, it's, it's not fair. They have to visit really yes. that. Honestly. And, and to an extent, yeah. if, you're, if you're trying to do that, you're overstepping your boundaries. because Exactly, you, for sure. They have, they have to want to do it, really. Yeah. Yeah, and you want them to do it. That's not how it works. You, and especially yeah. if you've done it yourself, you're like, oh my yeah. God, this will revamp your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be so much further. Yeah. You'll be down the path. You'll be like soaring. You just got to do this work. You just got to yeah. do this incredibly hard work. It's going to make you feel like shit. Yeah. Hey, you're going to hate things and you're going to cry and you're going to be angry. And yeah. They're telling them it's worth it, though. It's worth it. It's worth like, it. It's worth it. I promise. <laughs> They're like, oh boy, I don't know about this. Yeah. Go, yeah, yeah. It's it's like if people have have an attachment to stuff, mm -hmm. people that are borders, um, yeah, real strong attachments to things. If they don't let those things go, like it's easy to tell them, hey, look, you got to get rid of some stuff. And they're like, either they're for it, like, yeah, I know, but I'm not ready to tackle it. Or, yeah. No, I don't mind your own business. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, man. It's uh, and I'm gonna get back into it. You know, I I took a break because um, the lady that I was seeing once COVID hit, she she started doing telehealth. She started doing online stuff, and uh, there was something for me like I just felt like this in person connection was so important to me that I felt, I felt, I felt like me being in her space, she could feel the energy more and feel, and I could release better where I'm looking and there's nothing, you know, I guess I just felt like me looking through a screen isn't as authentic. Um, so it pushed me away from it. Uh, but I'm realizing now that it's, it's just something you pick back up and you, you keep going. But what I did was I did it for about, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my phone set here because I, I had to charge it and it's, yeah. it's a little craziness. Um, so I took a break from it and uh, I, I I did it. So I finished right before I left for Costa Rica, which was in January. And then I was out there for three months. When I was out there, you know, you would think that you're going to be having the best time and, you know, everything's good. And in my mind, I said, this is this is kind of like, in a way, the last straw, like I need this to really help me because I was going through it. You know, I was, I was in a very depressed state. Uh, and I just, I've always been hopeful and I, I have nothing but faith in my heart, in my mind. Um, and I knew that that was always, there was no doubt in that, but I needed, I needed to just get away from a lot of this stuff that was going on. So 
yeah. the way I did it. I let I, I did it for like four or five months leading up to Costa Rica. And Jesse and I went and, you know, traveled the country for three months. He we went to Envision Festival. But while I'm out there, I it wasn't this like unbelievable <laughs> enlightening experience. It was enlightening, but it wasn't this blissful experience like I was expecting. It was actually like the after effect of what the therapy I did, where I just, I mean, as much as I love Jesse, I felt like we were just, I was more reserved and quiet. We were kind of just doing our own thing because I'm still processing everything. And for me, I'm close enough with him that I don't have to try to fake it and be like, everything's fine. Let's be smiling and you know happy. I just was like, if you know me, you know that I like, I tend to take it in and I, I just don't put it out there. I try to not burden anybody. And, I, and that's it. It can be an issue too, you know? So I just took it on myself and uh, it wasn't for like a couple of weeks in that I finally get to open up and say like, I'm really going through it. And just like life right now doesn't feel normal like it was. And it's a process, it's a, it's a journey. And he was there to help me for that and having conversations because uh, he's had his own journey. Just, you know, I've helped him, he's helped me and, and that whole, that's why we're great friends. But uh, I think I think I was expecting like, this is the saving grace. I'll go to another country and I'll realize that life's all perfect. And, and while I was out there, it really wasn't until like the last week that I really start feeling like euphoria. And then when I came home, um, I came home to Florida because we had dr driven from St. Pete. Oh, I'm sorry. We drove, we drove from Philly to St. Pete, Florida, stayed there for like a week. And then we flew out to Costa Rica. But when we came home, we flew into St. Pete again and we stayed there because we had Jesse's car. So we heard about the pandemic and we heard about like, this is March 10th. I got into, into um, uh, St. Pete, which is like the peak, the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm, no masks in Costa Rica, nobody's talking about it. And we start hearing it more and more. And even St. Pete was this little bubble that nothing was happening. All the restaurants were open. Nobody talked about it. And I was like, maybe we shouldn't go back home. Maybe we should just stay here. And so we actually milked it there until it started coming to Florida. Then we were on the road and, and we like, you know, went to Shenandoah and we hit, you know, all the, the great spots on the way home. But as we're getting closer to Philly, it's like doomsday, you know, it's like, oh, no, this restaurant's closed and masks everywhere. And then before I know it, I'm locked down with my parents yeah. coming, coming from Costa Rica where it's like life is good. I'm in the free. I'm, eat, I'm eating. I'm eating fruit off the trees and monkeys yeah. above me. And I'm back to my little room in my parents' house that I grew up in. I'm like, I need to get the hell out, you know, and I yeah. the reason that I waited so long, like I was I was going to years ago, yeah. but then I got a car accident. And then I needed, you know, to be home for six months. I needed my mom to help me. And then um, after that, I, I just kind of, it just kind of prolonged. I didn't actually like get to, I was going to, you know, get a spot with my cousin. That didn't work out. So I told myself I need to get a place. Like this is the time. So I found this in the midst of the whole pandemic. I found my apartment that she saw. And, uh, and I feel like, cause I went to a neurologist though, cause I thought I was having like brain issues. Cause I, I had done this heavy metal stuff. So I'm thinking something's wrong with my brain. I didn't know how, how it worked. Cause all I kept feeling was head fatigue and dizziness. So mm -hmm. I'm talking to the neurologist. He's like, you know, I guarantee once you get your own, uh, own place, 80% of your problems are going to go away. He's like, it's, it, you just got to do it. And I did it. And I swear, man, I mean, I've done a lot of work myself, but I'm in a much different place now. And even probably when I saw you last, but even before that, like almost a complete 180, because I just, um, I'm able to process things better without like distractions or being in my parents' house and trying to act as if everything's fine or honey, is everything okay? And you're just, yeah, yeah. You know, just not, yeah, just not going there with them because it's nothing against them. I love them to death, but I just like, I didn't want to put that on anybody. We're all having our own problems, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so now that I'm in my own spot, I'm able to eat the foods that I want. I, I can exercise when I want. I can journal when I want. And, uh, but now that I mentioned journaling, I want to mention one more thing about, um, what's been helpful for me. Once I started going through this therapy, my, um, therapist, she was like, I would really suggest you start journaling. You know, do you write it all? I was like, yeah, I've actually writing's one of my strongest things in, in school is always like above average in writing. And I, I like it. So I started doing journaling and what I did in Costa Rica, um, I got a nice journal, like a leather bound journal. 
and it's like this thick. And I wrote down on another piece of paper, like eight things that really bother me, eight traumatic experiences, yeah. six to eight from childhood, as far as I can remember. And I just went into detail each one. Yeah. And I'm talking like one incident could have been 12 to 15 pages, as long as it needed until it like came out. So that whole book I filled yeah. up in Costa Rica. So I have like a book's worth ready. So if I ever want to write a book, I, it's wow. all in that journal, really. And because uh, I think we all have a story to tell, you know, and there's a lot of people who yeah. who go through these journeys and then they just go on with their life. But I feel like if I'm going to go through it, I want the next person to benefit or take a little shortcut of what I learned or what I didn't learn and then relearned. You know, it's like if I can save somebody else some time, um, I would love to give it, but at the same time, they have to go through what they have to go through. You know, it's like, you can only try to help so much, but they got to walk down that path too, but I'll hold your hand and I'll, I'll support you and clap at you on the back along the way. But yeah, yeah man. Yeah. So it's, it's a difficult journey, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I did actually, I, I went through that myself this past year. Or, or yeah. Actually very similar. Okay. Um, and, and diving into those things, it's really interesting how those events that occur yeah. can fill up 10, 12, 15 yeah. pages of yeah. like pure emotion, things mm -hmm. that just mm -hmm. like highest of things. Yeah. And another another way to put it is that there's an emotional charge mm. on the event that occurred. So as long yeah. as the emotional charge is there, yeah. you're you're kind of yeah. hooked. Yeah. You're hooked by it, even though oh, yeah. it would be free. Yeah. As long as there's an emotional charge there, you're hooked. Mm -hmm. And then when you start to release those emotional charges, those hooks start to like disappear and you mm. start to feel lighter. You start to feel yeah. yourself. You start to feel different. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, it's really life changing work. It is. It is, man. It's life changing work and it can yeah. really alter your whole path. Completely. Believe it or not. Like it's, yeah. It's a, uh, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why it's not more talked about. Like, yeah, I know. Things, yeah. They're, they're, they're not pushed as like good yeah. solutions and there's stigmas against it. Um, yeah. What's that about? Let's talk about the stigma of therapy because yeah. that, why was it that, you know, therapy? Oh, you're going to therapist. Yeah. He's got a therapist. You know? He's got a therapist. Like, I, remember, I remember making fun of my brother. When he was yeah. in like fifth grade yeah. or something, he was having issues at home. So they're like, yeah, of course. Oh, shit out. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you're the one going to the therapist. Yeah. Like, that's that's my comeback to him. Yeah. It's like, why, why is that? Somebody yeah. who's seeking help mm -hmm. shouldn't shouldn't really be the like made fun of. It's yeah. like, hey, good for you, man. Like, yeah, not yeah. a lot of people go mm -hmm. for that help. Yeah. See, the thing is, it, it's looked at as a weakness. But yeah. if you were to tell me that somebody's weak for going to therapy, I, I'd shake my head and say it's actually a strength because you, one, it takes a lot of courage. You know, if we want to talk like masculine energy of being that warrior that's going to fight, you yeah. need to be, you need to fight, you need to bring both energies to the table. You need to be yeah. the warrior who says, I'm going to, I have the courage to do it and I'm going to go down that path and I'm going to go with a fight. And then you got to bring, you got to touch that, you got to touch the part of you, the, uh, tap into the feminine side, which is allowed to release emotions, which is allowed to be vulnerable. Like, I'll be honest with you, man. I, I'm not a crier, you know, I'm not like a, I'm not a, I don't really, I, I had a tough time being able to release emotions throughout this because I don't know how I'm like, I don't know how to cry. I can't, it's not coming out. It was almost like I'm numb to it. Right. Yeah. So once I started doing this therapy and I started tapping into these actual traumatic events i mean i was bawling my eyes out in therapy where i was it was coming to the surface i was making sense of it and the way that my therapist did it it was powerful man she would be like you know like i'll just give you an example it's like one of the times back in children's hospital when i was like a little boy and and i was in an mri for four and a half hours and i was strapped up here with my arms like that and my legs were strapped right and i'm in this tunnel of an mri for four and a half hours crying my eyes out saying get me out of here get me out of here nobody heard me for hours so I, it was as if i was buried alive right and yeah. that's what my therapist said yeah and so 
when I'm doing this trauma therapy, and of course I had all kinds of tubes in me, MRI, um, IVs every day and your blood work every day and all these kinds of things. As a kid, as a 10 year old, you're looking at your body, like what is actually, what's going on, you know? So I just brushed it under the rug because I grew up and I, it was just something that happened when I was younger. Mm. Um, and then, you know, so I'm talking to the therapist and she's like, cause I, I tend to have that, like uh, the wiser older brother or whoever, like if I'm talking to myself in therapy, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to give him wisdom, right? Or give him guidance. And she would say stuff like that. No, he doesn't want your guidance. He doesn't want your wisdom. He wants you to hold him and say you're there That's for right. him. You know? And it's like, and then, and then I would do it. And it's like, what is he telling you now? Yeah. You know? And like, I would listen to my body and in this, this like deep therapy, I'm, I'm communicating with the little boy that was in that situation. Mm -hmm. And he's saying he's scared. He doesn't know what's going on, you know, all these kinds of things. And once I felt that I was able to like release these emotions and then it's just powerful, man, that that emotion, whatever that is, that is able to allow me to, to cry a lot mm -hmm. has been stuck in there for years. And you, that energetic charge that you were talking about it makes you wonder like when that's not processed, what, does the charge do to the body and where does it direct us and how do we yeah. is it is it sending impulses to my brain to think a certain thing or crave a certain thing it's like so, so once i have that together i'm like it makes it worth doing because the work is constantly evolving and you're constantly growing from it so these are all good things yeah so to working on the lighting there yeah yeah i gotta uh get some lighting sun's going down so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. gonna, I know. We're gonna switch it around and see if these Christmas lights provide enough. But yeah, man, that's that's really good stuff, honestly. Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's insane how how we're not taught that all that yeah. much. We're we're really not. Um, you know what? What else I was thinking about is what we were talking about last time when we were we were at the art studio uh, in Doylestown, and you and I spent the day, and we were talking about colors of things. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I do. About cl clothing and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I used to wear a lot more darker clothes, like not not from an emo aspect, but I would wear a lot of black shirts, you know, jeans, black hats. Like, I never knew what that was about. Mm -hmm. I never, I never really associated anything to it. Uh, I would just, that was just, I thought it looked good and I look good in that color or yeah. I just was drawn to it, whatever. Uh -huh. So now that I've done some work, I'm actually wearing much more colorful clothes. And, and lately I've been, buying, I've been buying like different colors, like nice blues and greens. And, and I'm like, wow, my wardrobe's changing. Like I literally have a drawer in my upstairs of just black shirts and, and like, you know, because I've accrued so much over some time, yeah. but now I'm like, color is life, you know, darkness is yeah. the absence of color. And I want to be more light, you know, and I want like, so my, I painted my walls in my apartment, like uh, filtered sunlight it's called. And I got colorful pictures everywhere. I got plants growing. Like I want, it, to yeah. me, I, I just feel like color is like life, you know, and you can bring that into your every day. And um, so it's really interesting because you pointed that out to me about like colors of yeah. like shirts and things. And I was like, yeah, you know, I think you put it in my awareness. And I started like analyzing myself I'm like, yeah, I don't have much right. color. Like, you know, yeah. I'm never you'll yeah. never see me in a red shirt or an orange yeah. shirt. you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's just how I've always been. But I now love like, like a, or like earth, uh, not earth tones, but like nice, like greens and blues and yellows and yeah. light oranges and things like that. And uh, so I guess, thank you for, for <laughs> bringing that to my awareness. Cause uh, like, yeah. and, and, and you mentioned like how that, that emotional charge affects aspects of our life. You yeah. would never think it would affect your wardrobe. Yeah, exactly. Like, what a yeah, wild, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wild thing. You're like, I don't want to wear that color. That color is too girly. That's mm -hmm. no, I'm going to stick with my blacks and brown. I got my style. I'm good with that. It's like, but why, why are you against the, the reds and the yellows? Yeah. High dyes. Is that, is that not? Yeah. So like diving into that, it is really interesting. And I noticed myself going through something similar. Like I went through the, the, a lot of shadow work this past year 
Yeah. And I remember looking at my closet and I was like, everything's in, everything in here is either black or blue. Yeah. Like, what is this? All, all like <laughs> bad shirts that I have. Yeah, blue. yeah. I literally searched in my closet. I found one thing that was red. And I was like, oh, oh my God, thank God I'm wearing this today. <laughs> There's color. Yeah. There's some color. I was mm-hmm. like, all right, let's, let's feel how red feels today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It be like a little bit nuts, but I was like, let's, let's see how yeah, I feel yeah. red. Uh-huh. And then as I was wearing red, I was like, this is fucking great. I love yeah. this. And uh-huh. then as I look at my wardrobe now, I'm like, I'll, I'm due to get some more colors, some more mm-hmm. like, some greens, some yellows, yeah. some oranges, some purples. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm ready to start, start filling out the rainbow. Yeah, I think it's a good sign, you know, to see people in some colors. Like it's like, not that there's anything wrong with black clothing, and I have a lot of it, and I still do wear it sometimes. But I, I once I've kind of connected the dots on that, I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, like it, it makes me think of Jim Carrey's movie or whatever documentary came out. It's like it's called like I needed color, I think, and. Uh, that title yeah. alone is like I need it's color. pretty deep you know because a lot of a lot of life can be bleak you know it could be very yeah. bleak grays whites blacks it's like color is life and if you look at a smoothie or an acai bowl or just fresh fruit you look at this orange that's peeled and you're like this is life you know this bright orange these colors where do these colors come from this yeah. is it it's really crazy but yeah yeah so, yeah man well this is this has been a, a time for for people to do do the like they're almost being forced to do some shadow work but Pretty much at like the if- same time they're being forced but they're also finding ways to not do it because it's scary and it's like just because I'm home now and I'm from home working or I have the time to research or I have the time to process emotions mm-hmm. I think that personally because I've done it and I know you have too, and we've at least experienced it, it almost feels like society is doing their shadow work, right? Like, yeah. so, like in a way, like we're seeing things come to the surface, uh, different kind of political things or things that didn't make sense in society. In a way, it's almost as if COVID is the therapy and the, the things that are happening are, are societal traumas that are coming to the surface and we're processing it. And that's why there, there's so much fear of like, what's happening? Where is this? If you can kind of relate it that way, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and we're going to get through it. It's just, we have to visit the dark parts uh, of society. Uh, and, and there's the grand scheme of that. There's that broad thing, but then each individual can do their part, you know? And then the collectively we move as a unit and we move to a better future. But as, as macro as it is, it's also very micro in our every day. We're just as important as the collective and we're just as responsible too to do our work. So Mm -hmm. to anybody out there doing it, you know, I give you credit. I commend you, salute you because um, I know what it did to me and it it kind of threw me off, um, threw me for a loop and I had to catch myself. And I did, and I think I'm in a better place now that I did it. Mm-hmm. But I'll be honest with you, I got in the accident four years ago, and it almost took me about two and a half, three years to really start feeling myself. And that's I'm not I'm not saying that to scare people off. Mine was I had a lot of different situations involved, but it just shows you in that year or two when you're in it, you could say to yourself, I'm never gonna feel better. You know, I'm never I'm never going to get out of this. I'm always going to be depressed, whatever. But I think I was raised, and shout out to my parents, to put faith into my life, to have um, some kind of higher power that I can uh, rely on, that can, when there's when you feel hopeless, there's something else out there that can potentially guide you. And from a young boy, I've had that in me, um, to, to feel like there's a source that, um, has saved me in a lot of situations, has, has pulled me out of certain situations, has protected me, all these kinds of things. So even in my lowest of low, I was still hopeful that this is for the better. This is for my growth. And uh, so if you're going through it, you know, know that it's for your growth and not, not just to, to, it's not to do it to hurt you or make you feel bad. It's actually to heal you. And it's, it's hard to see that in the moment but doing the work is part of the healing. Um, and that's all we're trying to do here is heal, you know, 
better ourselves, heal the parts of us that have been damaged. And then there's that. And then it gets deeper than that because then there's ancestral traumas, you know, and uh, there's things that you could have experienced from a past life, you know, and there's, there's stuff that your parents inherited that then passed on to you that you had nothing to do with that you, that you have to take on. Like perfect example, what I said before with the diabetes, I, you know, I was born into that fat, this family that had diabetes in the bloodline. And thankfully through my own work, I was able to see that as a toxic, I guess, characteristic of the bloodline where I could prevent it if I could do it. You know, if I had the right tools and the right knowledge about it, I can be the one that could potentially stop it. And so I took that on, which on top of everything else was already so much. But I said to myself, this is this is my journey. You know, this is me, the warrior, the vulnerable warrior <laughs> who is like, yeah. you know, able to to fight this uh, for the greater good of humanity you know uh, and not to take it on to my put it on my shoulders in that sense but like try to do my part is what i'm trying to get at like do what i can with the tools that i have to do my part so and i know you do the same thing and and there's you know there there's there's a lot of like-minded people who feel that same way and i'm attracted to those kind of people because it feels like we're really in it together and it's not just for us to feel better, but it's like for the collective and the future generations to feel better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's interesting. And like, if you do that work, you have the ability to really change like your lineage, like how your kids grow up. Yeah. How yes. You're you, you saw what your parents passed down to you. You said, yeah. okay. And then you took that as you were a kid and then it became your stuff. And then eventually as you go mm -hmm. through the work, you start to separate what's yours and what's theirs. And then you work on giving them their stuff back. Mm. And you're like, all right, now I gotta, I gotta work and letting that stuff go, giving that back. Yeah. Now I gotta work on my stuff that I came mm -hmm. to work with. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, and that, that stuff really, like for me, one of the things that I came to this world with was being a perfectionist. Yeah. And like the strong desire to want everything to be perfect, want mm. to be right, want things to go a certain way. Like perfect example, when I was a kid and I was like raking the leaves at my grandparents' house, I would try to get every leaf off the lawn, every single leaf. And it made no sense because there were leaves falling behind me. <laughs> it made no yeah, sense. Yeah. Waste of effort. But in my head, I'm like, I got if I'm going to do this, I got to get every leaf. And so one thing my dad told me at one point was, hey, Dougie, you got to remember that the level of work that you do, your 80% is like 95%. Or mm -hmm. your 90%, yeah. if you hit 90, 92%, you're good. Mm -hmm. If you hit 95%, you're good. You don't yeah. have to go for 100% because that last 5% might drive you mad. Mm. It's true. Yeah. yeah. It might not be worth your time. And like similar similar situation as with this podcast like i wanted to do a podcast on a different topic good couple maybe like three four years back um on another topic and i was trying to go over every situation in my head went over like who can i get as guests like i was watching other podcasts some of them had like scripts or questions they would ask their guests mm -hmm. um like what what recording device how to put it out like what what podcasting platforms and i'm like this is too much i ended up like over analyzing it and not yeah. doing any of it mm -hmm. i came up with the name and that was it <laughs> that was it yeah. all anybody ever i don't even know if they saw the name it was on a website and it was like a menu bar a menu mm. item that you could choose but the website said to like podcast is coming soon okay that'd be the only way people saw the name other than that yeah. nothing was put out and that was because like i had to be careful like not to let perfection stop mm. progress exactly because i i saw I, my uh, i saw my one yeah. friend who was who was doing podcasts chris banish um, yeah shout out to him because i was on his podcast to start yeah i would yeah. talk to him about how he would do it and he would he was like walking in the park, talking on his phone, recording a podcast, and there's wind in the background. And you can just like kind of hear him. 
and he'll he's he'll put that out and i'm like it was kind of revolutionary to me so i was like wait a minute it, it doesn't have to be perfect mm -hmm. and yeah i can figure it out as i go i can mm. work through the kinks if the first one isn't yeah. great okay how mm -hmm. can the next one be better not yeah. the first one has to be perfect before it goes out Oh no! If, if you do the that, the first one's never gonna be perfect. Oh yeah. my god! It's yeah. never. It's never. a journey, you know. It's like yeah. it's like anything else. Yeah, but I think your see your awareness, like you'll see a situation like Chris's, yeah. and say, okay, I'm gonna take his progress aspect because yeah. he's putting it out. But there's the perfectionist in me that's gonna say, I'm gonna still put it out, but I'm gonna lower my perfection a little bit, as like your standards up here, you know bring it to here and then it, it can go out. And I'm the same way, man, because yeah. the two, two professions that I have, you know, cooking and, and painting, painting houses, I have to be meticulous. I have to be that one that has a standard. There's a great quote that I was told by a manager one time that says the, the things you allow is the, is the standard you keep, you know? And, and I always thought about that, but there's a, a standard that I, like, for example, I'm not just going to put out any dish, you know, because if it's not up to my standard, then I'm not going to put it out there. And if it's not, if these walls, if the lines on the paint, you know, if you're painting a wall, uh, cutting in a wall and the lines are all crazy and it paints on the ceiling, well, I can't put my name on that either, you know? So it's the happy medium of the perfectionist, which is a good thing. You know, I'd rather be a perfectionist than somebody who could give it who could care less because the way i see it perfectionist is a form of self-mastery you know because if you're on a journey of self-mastery which is like self-awareness and self-mastery they're like the tip of the pyramid you know that's what we work towards of being like masterful in everything we do and self-aware of everything we do um you gotta it's like okay if there's that and i'm climbing the pyramid to get to that well aren't you a perfectionist then but then there's also the toning it down of like you're never going to be perfect you know right. so it's like yeah. this crazy dichotomy of like I, i'm supposed to be perfect but i'm not perfect yeah you know so and, and uh, at the same yeah. time i am perfect right now exactly exactly it's, it's like and there's perfection oh, in all of it yeah yeah, yeah that's, hold that uh, thought i'm gonna put a light on because i'm losing light too i was i was gonna say that yeah yeah we're both we're both losing light That's that's a that's an interesting aspect too. I was yeah. one that, that I found that was so interesting this past year was that of like all the paradoxes that I started to notice going on throughout the year. Like that's a perfect example of you're never going to be perfect, yet at the same time you are perfect. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah, man, I feel that one. <laughs> I was like yeah how how could this be true i was like yeah. oh my god that's a like how, how does so there he is perfect yeah uh, right i was i was hitting a number of those as i was tr trying to figure out like I, I was at a point where i i wanted to be truthful and like i wanted to tell the truth to everybody be open and honest to everybody and then i was like telling people things and then i was like I ended up telling people like things that they didn't care about, but then they mm. like suddenly cared about. Mm. And I was like, I got to the point of like, well, how far back do I end up like telling the truth? Like, do I tell the kid in, in third grade that I broke his DS? Cause he mm. didn't mean to me on, at recess or on the playground. <laughs> do, do I go that far back? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think that's really necessary. Yeah. Like, you got to forgive yourself. And that's yeah. Big. But I was like, I think I could take this too extreme, like being too truthful, <laughs> too honest. And and I heard a quote from a, a mentor of mine, which is like a, a really interesting quote. But he said, you know, sometimes telling the truth doesn't help anybody. Mm. I was like, hmm. Yeah. The truth can hurt a lot of people, you know, yeah. especially now in today's society. If you try to be truthful, yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's it's yeah. tough. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like it meeting. Yeah, I mean, it's not not that you, you don't want to be truthful. You always want to be truthful, but you being truthful of how you feel about somebody 
can be very hurtful because they don't know how to take it. So it's also that fine line of like me telling the truth, you know, there's, that reminds me of another quote. Uh, yeah. On the same lines, it's like what somebody doesn't know won't hurt them. Yeah. There's yeah. that too. So it's uh-huh. like, wow. So how do these quotes like overlap each other? Yeah. How, does, how do they? I know, man, there's so many paradoxes in the spiritual world. Yeah. I was just thinking of another quote. Um, wait, what were you just saying? What's the quote that you said about um, truth? Sometimes telling the truth doesn't help anybody. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it reminded me of this one quote where it's like, maturity is knowing how little requires your comment. You know, where you think to yourself, like, I can respond to this person in the comment section and give them my peace of mind or whatever. It's like, maturity is knowing that that's okay they don't i don't need to argue with them i'm gonna walk away from it, you know so yeah. once i thought of that i'm like that that kind of coincides with what you're talking about how mm-hmm. i could be truthful right now and i could tell this person how i really feel yeah. or i could say i'm gonna just walk away and, and yeah. be mature about it you yeah, know right it's it's yeah. like telling the truth really helped that situation. yeah 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 and th- there's another quote that one of my mentors uh wayne dyer who i've always loved rest in peace yeah, yeah back to what you were saying about forgiving like that younger you know the kid or whatever he had a great quote and it might not be him but it says uh well there's two actually love is forgiving and love is forgiving you know Mm. where loving forgiving someone is to love them so love is forgiving and love is forgiving um and there's another one uh forgiveness is the scent the tulip gives off on the heel that crushed it. So that oh, one's oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. that's Mark Twain, by the way. But yeah, wow. forgiveness is the smell, the scent that the flower gives off from the heel that crushed it. So, so somebody who did you wrong, you know, you not you that that essence that comes from that without you doing anything to hurt them again, there's love there. There's that's forgiveness, you know. So those kind of quotes I just love. I love quotes. I love like, like, like uh, those kind of meaning meanings that have like a, a little deeper kind of like, you gotta, you gotta let it play out a little bit. It's not just surface base. It's like, let that, let that sink in for a little kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Like all, all the paradoxes that were coming yeah. up this year for me were, they were starting to throw me for a loop. <laughs> I was like, how, how does this work? Like yeah. you're, you're told as a kid, always tell the truth. Mm-hmm. And then I was going at a point where I was telling the truth to everybody. And I was like, people were getting upset. Things were developing. <laughs> I'll tell them the truth. <laughs> All the situations were coming up again. Yeah. Like very energetically charged time. And I was like, oh boy, this is, this is a lot. Yeah. Um, so that like all came up. Um, just, just so many paradoxes. It was like, there is man. And, and I've said that a lot because I feel like you won't know that there's paradoxes until you go down the path and wait, wait, I'm learning this, but this means that like, I can't give examples right now, but I I visit them and I realize the paradox on a daily basis of like just so many, but what I've learned with these kind of paradoxes in those situations, there's, there's an internal truth. There's a uh, intuitive kind of what your intuition says, you know, like he, you know, just, taking in all different kinds of knowledge and wisdom from different things, but a lot of it could be BS, you know? So you have to digest it, internalize it, and then feel, is that truth to me? Like, is is that aligned with who I am? And if it feels that way, then to me, that, that, that's a good indicator of like, like, you know, if you're, if there's, I don't know if you know, but I feel like there's a, a feeling that we get when there's a truth that we're confident enough with, with saying, yeah. of like you know that we don't have to question is that a truth or not like just being kind to, to people or you know loving one another or like helping one another those are just truths to me that they're they're kind of core values or principles uh and there's like a bunch of them that i have gained over my life or lifetimes that i just i i can stand behind it and know that i can put that message out there because i feel it's a truth um, but things that I don't know, I won't try to put out there because I just, it might not be real, you know? Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's a fun journey. It That's is, man. For sure. It's, 
it's not always fun. It's sometimes yeah. a lot of work. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's too much mental game, too many mm -hmm. thoughts, trying to like logically figure out what to do or mm -hmm. feel it out. I remember like in this past year, I was, I was, came to the realization that I was like, I was very like logical in how I would go about it. Very left brain. Yeah. Like what's the best way to go about figuring the situation out? Um, how can I like, what's the most efficient use of my time? How, what's the best way to go about this? Basically, and that was like logically. And then the other route, which I figured out was diving into like the femininity, because like I never really went really into that, was you can just go about your day by how you feel. Yeah. Like, not like plan your breakfast the night before, but like, why do I feel like eating? Yeah. What, what do I mm -hmm. feel like doing? And then just, just like, so totally, instead of like setting a schedule, so totally going with the flow. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And I would get those feelings like being really in the flow, like after going to a music festival, because mm. usually those music festivals, like you're, you're drinking, you're, you're doing drugs. Those things are more in and in and, and yin. Yin is more like linked with feminine, whereas uh -huh. yang and yang is more linked yeah. to masculine. And yeah. so being at that festival is for so much and then not really eating too much or eating when you needed to, when you wanted mm -hmm. to, when it was time to eat. But you would leave and you'd be like on this high and you'd be feeling very in and very in the flow and just like things would just like work out so great. And then I remember I would go back to like the, the way I would normally be. I was like president of an honor society at the time and I was planning events and like, the amount of steps to plan an event, the, the correct way, the way the school wanted them planned was like, you had to have the publicity done 35 days before the event. Yeah, it's like your posters and everything that was gonna be like put out. It was like driving me mad. But it was, that was, that was like, there are two sides to it. And then after I went like the, the go, with, go with how things feel, mm -hmm. It was, okay, I do that for so long. Now, when do I go back? Do I yeah. go back? Yeah. Do I want to go back? Mm. Should I go back? And a lot, I'll be honest, a lot of this past year was being stuck in indecision, being mm. stuck in that middle point. Dude, of like, me too, man. Oh, you too? Yeah. Me too. I couldn't make a decision. Oh, my God. I talked about, I talked about that in therapy. I was like, yeah. I can't. I can't figure out what I want to eat. I can't figure out like where I want to go. I can't, yeah. I was like, hey, what is that, man? I don't know what that was. Literally, it was, yeah. it was like a state of being stuck in indecision. Yes, mm -hmm. I felt that same thing. That, that, That's crazy. that was so, yeah. honestly, I remember like going through that. Um, I, uh, what is it? There was like many times, like I remember doing mushrooms one time and like, that they have like an interesting effect where they kind of exacerbate whatever whatever's going on in your head. Like if you're having a great yeah. time, you're having a great day. Yeah. You're gonna have a great time. Mm -hmm. uh, like I remember being stuck in indecision at this one point, and then I smoked a little bit. I was sitting on this log and I was like, do I wanna walk and go get a smoothie? Or do I wanna walk back home and get an apple? <laughs> and I'm sitting on this log and I'm like, I don't know whether to go this way or to go that way. <laughs> I was like, just like internally screaming. Yeah. It was like both sides are pulling in opposite directions. Well, you know, it's funny. You went the right way. Regardless, like you ended up going the right way because you wouldn't be here talking to me if you did it. It's like, there's, oh it's funny. There's God. perfection in it all, but it's almost our awareness thinking like, wait, do I have control of which way I'm going? Dude, that used to mess with me a lot. I used to yeah. think like, okay, if, if God or, you know, whatever consciousness you want to call it source, yeah, is it, if this is guiding me and uh, it's guiding me to go left, I'm going to go right. Cause I think I'm in control. And then I'm like, wait, right was what I was supposed to do anyway. Yeah. And you think of it in that sense, like there's actually no messing up in this life. It's, it's constantly for our growth. If we want to grow, you know, it's like, we're getting put in these situations and, you know, you could be like, oh, why me? And I'm the victim and, and all this. Or what I've learned to do, and this is a very difficult spiritual practice, but mm -hmm. when you're going through something very debilitating or difficult, 
if you can thank it while it's happening. And, and mm. I'm on my knees, looking up at the sky and saying, thank you, with tears running down my face, knowing that one day I'm going to thank it, but I can't, I don't know what this means right now. And I started trying to practice that of like situations that weren't good in my life. And I would say, thank you, because because of this, I'm going to go down a journey and I'm going to find some kind of answer here. Um, so now looking back, like, you know, I can't tell too many people this because they'd be like, what? But I, I could say the car accident was one of the best things that ever happened to me because where it's taken me and the therapy that I had to go through and the, and that accident brought me to my other traumas, which then brought me to another place. So if you really reel it back, those things that we, we constantly think is like the worst thing that ever happened to me is actually the same thing that has led us on this trajectory of where we're going. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, it's, it's, Personally, I just have felt a lot of gratitude lately. Um, friends, family, my living situation, you know, my, I think society has, is it, it's, it's, uh, it's gone through a lot and it's allowed us to re reflect. And I've gone through my own journey, but I came out of it with two things is two glaring things for me is, is gratitude and compassion is compassion for people who also go through it. Um, that we don't know about, you know, we could see somebody on a bus or a train and they're just looking down, but you don't know their story. You know, you don't know that they're going through their shadow work. And we just think, oh, why is this person nasty to me? And this person just flipped me off. It's like, if you can step in their shoes and you can step in anybody's shoes, and I'm not just talking to the person who cuts you off, but some of the worst people that we know of, mm -hmm. there's still compassion somewhere in them or in you for them. And, uh, it's, it's a difficult spiritual practice, but I recommend the book, The Art of Compassion, because it opened my eyes up to a lot of things. Like I, I used to be harsh on my dad for eating some of the ways he did, because here I am. I'm a plant-based chef who knows how to cook that has done all the research to know that this is the most uh, beneficial decision and, and, and lifestyle that I could pick. And here's my own father who I'm watching, you know, cooking ground beef and eating, drinking Pepsi and doing all these things. And I'm like, oh, that hurts inside. And so for a little while, I tried to push it on him. of like yeah. showing him the light of what he could do and how this will make you feel better. And you could, you know, remove some of these ailments that you have and the neuropathy and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I had to go through that journey to realize that he's running his own race. He's going through his journey. And it might be a different journey than I am. And I, who am I to say you should do this? And so I went through that to realize that what I can do in my power is lead by example. Yeah. Support, support the things that I love, put my money behind the organizations that I believe in, live my life as if I want, I want to be an example for everybody, you know, and just like I'm taking the, uh, other people as an example of how I want to live my life. So and you're an example of that too. And I feel like that's all we can do is be an example. And if people take heed to that and they go, oh, okay, that's whatever he's doing, I'm interested in. And I, I want to maybe look into that. That's on them to decide. It's not on you. And um, it's a humbling experience to realize that all you have to worry about is yourself, you know, and, and it's so easy to think, oh, I learned all about this and why don't you do it? And, and then once you go down this path, you look at society, it's like, what are we doing? You know, what is going on right now? Um, but there's compassion there. They don't know better. You know, that that not all society, I'm just saying like a lot of the masses are in the situation that they're in because they literally don't know better. They think that that's what's truth. Uh, and so you have to feel, feel for them uh, for where they are. And uh, that's been a good lesson for me. So that's a big lesson too. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when you, when you have the desire, like, so, so you wanted to help your dad with his eating or yeah. you know, like I work through things myself so I can, like the more you work through your things, the easier it kind of is to see other people's things. Mm -hmm. like sometimes seeing our own things is, is the toughest part. Toughest yeah. thing to do. It's easy to, to spot yeah. out what somebody else needs to do. Mm. Doing it for ourselves is, is tougher. <laughs> so and, true. And so when you get into that state of like wanting to help somebody or wanting to do something for somebody or wanting them to change their life in, in some kind of way, it's, it's really, it's, uh, we got to remember that, that we can't, 
we're not in charge of anybody else. Mm-hmm. It's not our job to save anybody. It's not our job. It's not our job. Mm-hmm. Our job is our responsibility. Yeah. We, we got to take care of us, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever that means. To, yeah. To me, to listeners, to whoever, we, we got to take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Somebody mm-hmm. else, like, like you said, wants to follow our example. Perfect. If they want our help, perfect. Exactly. But you really can't help anybody mm-hmm. no. who doesn't want your help. Yeah. They have to help themselves, and we could be there to hold their hand. Yeah. yeah. yeah and we can, if, and, they don't, and that, if they don't want your help, yeah. don't, don't help them. No. Because, because if, what, if what happens, you're going to get in trouble. You can't. When you force it. bothering them. Exactly. You're when you force much. it. You push them away too when you try to impose and you say, "Why aren't you doing this?" or "Why aren't you, you know, eating this way?" or "Why do you? Yeah, why, why don't you? Why don't? Why won't you just become more like me?" Exactly. It's so why, easy to push I just something want you on. To be more like me. <laughs> yeah. How egotistical like does that me, sound? <laughs> if you're not gonna be like me, I'm gonna get angry at you. Yeah, yeah. Because you're you're being you and you're being bad and be like me. I'm good. You got to be more like me. That's that's yeah. your problem. But you're already taken, you know? That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. There's only yeah, one no, of you. That's, so. that's your problem right there. Yeah. You're, more, you're too much like you. You got to yeah. be more like me. Yeah, exactly. That's the, the ego. It's like, everyone, be like me. I'm the I, got, I got the answers. It's like, yeah. it makes yeah. so much to just be more like me and you'll be, you'll be set. You'll be more of any yeah. problem. And, and, I'm gonna t- and I'm gonna tell you why you shouldn't be you. You know, <laughs> because, because you're hurting yourself in all these yeah. ways, mm-hmm. you just got to be more like me. It's yeah. that simple, man. Yeah, it, it you you do like I feel like when you have that mindset, which I've been there before. You know, you put yourself on a pedestal, and it's like, yeah. come down, humble yeah. yourself, yeah. bring yourself down a little bit, because who are you to think you have the answers? And, you know, for me, I used to, once I was doing the sun gazing and I was putting out this spiritual content, yeah. you know, I, I had that insecurity of like, like nobody would ever give me backlash, you know, nobody would ever like question my post. But internally, I always felt like, who do they think I am thinking I know the truth? You know, like, who's this guy who went to North Penn with these other kids, you know, that now has the answers right and so i used to tell people like friends of mine i'd be like you know it bothers me to think that others think that i have the answers which i'm just playing out in my head and no and the people i've talked to like no we we appreciate your content you know to but in my head i'm thinking egotistical like oh i'm just blowing up my ego like yeah. but it's it's deeper than that it's like this was uh internal truths that i was gifted to by different you know elements of the of the earth and and, uh the world the universe and stuff but yeah man it's uh you know it's cool because you're doing this podcast i feel like you and i are both going to leave after this and we're going to go continue doing our work you know in our journey we might not do it for you know tonight or even next next week i'm just saying we it's almost when you have a podcast and you get these different guests on, you can check back in of the work that you've been doing, you know? And I love that aspect of it. And I can hear through you just come converse with me, like, and me too, like we're putting together the pieces of things that we've actually learned and the tools that we've gained on our own journey. And uh, sometimes you either, like I have some friends, we do meditations together where it comes out through that, where I needed to be like with a group of people or one person and just, be a little more vulnerable and and like vent and also like process the journey and when i talk to you i feel like we both like you know we've gained our tools in our life but some of these come out when i'm talking because if yeah. i'm not talking to you i'm go- i'm going to work i'm you know maybe working yeah. out like i'm i'm a lot more by myself yeah or a couple of friends or whatever but it's not always like the we're not checking back in all the time, you know, life just goes on, you're hanging out, you know, whatever, but very little do we get a heart to heart, like our hearts are open right now talking. And I feel like those, those gems are, they come to the surface. It's, it's like, we have to realize what we've learned, you know, of, of what things that we've seen and like the, the journey we've taken. So I'm grateful for the platform because like, you're able to check back in with these people who you're going to have on. 
And that's really important, man, because some people don't get the opportunity to check in. And that's huge. It's very big. Yeah. yeah. And that's what meditation is good for, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and these things, they don't usually come up unless you're having conversations. Yeah. Like yeah. How often are you talking about the paradoxes and being stuck yeah. in a decision that makes you want to scream into yeah. <laughs> Not often. Very, yeah. You're not, you're not yeah. saying that to the average. Yeah. Because people don't go there. That's the thing. No. Like, most people they don't really want to go there because it's like ooh feelings these are i don't know what these are you know like where like you and i both we're, we're on the same page on everything it's like we can we can we can go there and there's no judgment and it's just like a free kind of feeling of like uh respect you respect me and like let's share with each other what we've learned and and this is going to help people and you know we're going to learn from people and we it's just this constant give and receive you know you pass it on uh i think that while i'm here on this earth that's what i want to do i want to take in as much wisdom as i can and and be of service to as many people as i can and the thing with that it's take it a step further is like being of service to people without the expectation of a re reward so not doing something thinking that like you know kind of bothers me when i see people like give money to the homeless and they film it like there's don't get me wrong i'm, I'm supportive that you're giving money but how much of that is just so people think you're this generous guy. Like if I'm ever giving stuff out, it's never on film, you know, it's, yeah. and I enjoy that. I, I enjoy helping people out. If I got a dollar in my pocket or 20, like you're getting it because you know, you are me and I am you kind of thing. So these are all our brothers and sisters, you know, on this planet. And uh, I just feel like if you could be of service to people and that's it, then you fulfilled a purpose in your life because that's all we want inherently we want to connect with people we want to help each other you know we want to do what we can to to grow and uh it feels good to to be in a situation that you can be of service and that's why i like cooking too because it's like i can actually put food i could put love into food and then i can serve it to people and it's like they can have an experience with it enjoy it and then it's like this interesting energetic exchange um that brings us closer together and if i could do it for free i would so that's that's one of my goals is to eventually get to a place where i'm cooking because i love it and it's more donation based than it is to make a check um you know hopefully with investments and that kind of stuff i don't have to worry about getting that check on a friday but rather doing it because i love it and to be of service to others so that's my goal and that's what i'm working towards Yeah. So, so how can the listeners find you? They oh man. What you're doing. I don't have money, many platforms anymore. So, um, I used to be on Instagram pretty active and then I got hacked. I had a, a friend of mine sent me like a oh, corrupted man. message and I got hacked and I got locked out of my account oh, and man. Instagram sent a recovery code to an email that I don't know the password of. So, it's interesting, man, because now that you know about that whole, you know, putting the the messages out through Instagram, like that had to stop completely where this was my life. This was like this was me releasing, you know, wisdom and, and things that I was inherently taking. Yeah. And then it just stopped. And I was like, wait, wait, what what do I do now? You know, like people are depending on me. This is people's like happiness. Like, I put all this weight on my shoulders. So now I don't really have an outlet, man. I don't I don't really. I try, I'm, I'm on Facebook, you know, John Bucci, B-U-C-C-I, but I'm not, I'm not active. And I'm also not trying to get back into feeling responsible to put out content because it was debilitating to me where I was like working all day and then coming home thinking like I had to put out something and then what do I pick? And, but it, it was just a lot. And right now I don't want to be the one trying to tell people how to live, especially with what's going on. So if they want to find me, you know, I think they'll find me and uh, it'll, it'll just come through the, how it does, you know, in the uh, serendipitous ways, but I'm out there. I'm not uh you'll find me in the back, in, in the back trails or off the trails yeah. somewhere. But uh, yeah, man, there's really, there's really nothing. I mean, Facebook, I'm not on YouTube. Uh, but stay tuned because I'm trying to start some type of cooking channel potentially or some kind of like outlet to uh, to cater to people eventually. That's something I'm working towards. So 
once I do have a name I won't share yet, but maybe off camera, but yeah, it's kind of, I'm, I'm working towards something. So, um, good things are coming. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm excited to check back in with you. Yeah, man. We'll do another one of these. Yeah. And I wish you all the, the best because, uh, you're a great host for a podcast and I feel like you're going to do well with this. And I remember talking to you about this like a couple of years ago, we had a long conversation about you getting into podcasts and it's like for us to be doing it. It's cool. So you it know? took a while, but yeah. we're finally here. We're, exactly. we got the wheels rolling. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Well, thanks again for choosing me, picking me and letting, holding the space for me to share and uh, realize some of these things that I've learned and you as well. So. Yeah, it's been a fantastic first podcast. First yeah, man. Over yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, brother, and thank you to all the people who listen. Hope yep, thanks. Wonderful conversation. I know I got a lot out of it. Yeah, man. Always do. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. It sounds good. Time. Until next time, and to all the people out there, I love you. Keep doing the work. Be gentle on yourself. Be compassionate for others, and be kind to one another. That's all I got. Amen to that. Well said. All right, brother. I love you. I'll be talking to you soon. I love you too, man. We'll, we'll catch up more soon. All right, man. You take it easy.